Death and the hereafter, Resurrection and Judgment Day. Every soul will taste death, the checkpoint of the hereafter, the destroyer of desires that we all detest. Allah knows that we hate it and hesitates at seizing the soul of his faithful servant who is at his behest. Well, family and power left behind cannot benefit the dead, only things classified as ongoing charity, like money left for charitable causes, beneficial knowledge, a praying child, a water well or a fruit tree. Some people claim to have entered the hereafter following near-death experiences, but that's one of Satan's ruses. He convinces evil ones that they'll go to heaven, and others that they'll reincarnate, and even the pious he confuses. In reality, while our soul is still attached to our bodies, we're not dead, just like sleeping is called a minor death. But the door to repentance closes upon death's rattle, and the soul becomes severed after the body's last breath. When we die, our souls cross over a permanent barrier, or barzakh, unable to re-enter life to repent for our sins. No one can ever cross back to life, and ghosts are impersonations of the dead done by life accompanying jinns. When a believer dies, beautiful angels gently remove the willing soul as if pouring water into a scented silken cloth. But scary angels tear out an evil soul like thorns ripped through wet cotton into a stinky sack to Allah's wrath. Angels ascend heaven's portals to record the believers as fortunate ones, writing it in the Iliun book's pages, announcing you as so-and-so, the child of so-and-so, using the best names to welcoming angels at higher stages. The Sijin book logs evil ones, and the angels refuse to take their souls beyond the first sky due to their stink. These souls are flung back into their decaying bodies from a great height, and to the earth they terrifyingly sink. The soul realizes it's back in the grave when it hears the footsteps of the barriers walking away. For shortly after this, it sees two angels approaching and they sit him up on that inevitable day. Two blue-black angels called Munkar and Nakir question the dead about three things in the grave, rather gravely. Asking about the dead person's Lord, religion and profit in life, Allah will help the believers to answer bravely. Allah is my Lord, Islam is my religion, and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is my messenger, are answers that rightly fulfill. The angels happily reply, you lived upon faith, died upon faith, and will be raised upon faith if Allah wills. The believer flinches from a vision of the place in hell he avoided, and a door to heaven is instantly opened instead, expanding to the horizon filled with light and perfume until resurrection day he sleeps peacefully in his grave bed. Their good deeds accompany them in the grave, appearing as beautiful beings comforting them by their sides. Believers long to meet Allah, resting as contented newlyweds with a heavenly zephyr in their spacious resides. When the disbeliever is sat up and questioned, unable to answer in fear what others said he will try to reprise. You lived upon doubt, died upon doubt, and will be raised upon doubt if Allah wills the angels will chastise. A rancid door to hellfire opens up and their ribs interlock as their grave is compressed and they burn in its harm. Disbelievers fear meeting with Allah and their bad deeds appear as ugly beings that taunt them and cause alarm. A blind and deaf angel strikes him by a huge hammer that would turn a mountain to dust, and he screams in pain. Humans are spared from hearing the torture of the punishment of the grave, otherwise in fear we'd turn insane. Whatever follows, the trial of the grave will be easier, for whoever succeeds at this stopping place will be saved. Until resurrection day, we will all wait in the grave. For the wicked, time will drag on. For believers, it will be waived. Special cases involve martyrs whose souls immediately reside in green birds able to enjoy heaven's delights, and dead infants whose souls gather to Prophet Abraham, peace be upon him, and plead to Allah for their parents' entry rights. 
angel Israfil will blow the trumpet or sword that will signal and then cause total universal annihilation. He will blow it again and souls and bodies will reassemble and be reunited for the day of resurrection. Allah will resurrect people from their dispersed constituent atoms, barefoot, naked and in excruciating terror. People won't pay attention to anyone's nakedness but fear Allah's judgment, scared to be exposed in error. The believers will be glowing from the marks of ablution or wudu they used to make for prayer. Disbelievers will run around frantically like moths chasing their light, begging believers to share. Allah will arrive with eight huge angels bearing his throne and heaven and hell will be brought close by. The day passes rapidly for believers but for others it lasts up to 50,000 years as they beg and cry. Allah will judge everyone, some gray-haired by fright, abandoned, with no one to help and all alone, sweating under a mile-high sun, waiting for the reckoning, only the blessed shaded by Allah's throne. Allah will question us about five things in minute detail that will show what our lives meant, how we used our lives, utilized our youth and knowledge, how we earned and what we spent. A mizan or measuring scale will be set up to weigh everyone's deeds, whether good or bad. Whoever's good deeds tip the balance to the right will go to Jannah. To fail here will be sad. Grievances between all people must be sorted out and settled before entering either eternal abode. Even do-gooders may go to hell as wronged ones claim compensation and leave empty their good load. Winners will receive their records in their right hands, passing life's examination and Allah's tests. Losers take them in their left hands, or get their books thrown behind their backs as hell's guests. Everyone will have to cross the Sirat bridge that spans over hell's pit and Jahannam's spiky hooks. It will be made wide and quick for the pious to cross, but be thin and treacherous for unworthy crooks. Everyone will assemble with the ones they loved, so each prophet will be surrounded by ones who followed his way. Those who worshipped idols will be drawn to their representative symbols and be dragged to hell straight away. Crowds will successively ask Allah's true prophets to intercede to Allah on their behalf, but each one will defer. From Adam to Noah to Abraham to Moses to Jesus, peace be upon them all, until eventually they all turn to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, to refer. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, will intercede on the last day after prostrating with a specially saved supplication dua. He, peace be upon him, will seek forgiveness for all worthy believers and Allah will graciously grant his intercession or shifa. Lastly is a sweet drink from the Prophet's, peace be upon him, fountain, basin or hold, after which a person will never thirst again. But angels will prevent those who mutated Islam by innovations or beda, whom the Prophet, peace be upon him, will disclaim. Angels will drag away those deservedly destined for Allah's punishment in hell in humiliation with miserable fates. Everyone will be eager to see their homes in Jannah, but Muhammad, peace be upon him, will be the first to enter heaven's gates. Allah will remove from hell believers who were punished for their sins but retained faith of a mustard seed's worth. Regenerated in its river banks, they'll enter heaven, the last one of whom will get a reward ten times that of earth. When everyone's place in heaven or hell is assigned, a ram representing death will be slaughtered for all to see. Winners in heaven will be ecstatic, whereas losers in hell will be dismayed, knowing they'll never die for eternity. Many believe there's nothing beyond death, but what's the point of chancing it and suffering an eternal disgrace? Wouldn't it be better to work towards an endless life of bliss in heaven, where you'd look directly at Allah's face?